It really is strange to think how something can be so popular, such a part of everyone's life, and then a generation or two later, just gone. Montgomery Ward fits perfectly into that category because they were one of the original major retailers. Up until a few decades ago, they were still one of the largest in the country and the largest that was privately owned. In 1997, they filed for bankruptcy, then in the year 2000, they filed for bankruptcy again and that was pretty much the end of it. Soon after, they closed all of their stores, ended all of their operations, and they no longer exist today. Well, technically, the name was bought by another company, and they use it as the name of their retail website, wards.com, but that's about it. So I want to talk about what happened here, and if you're already depressed by this video, I should tell you right now that it's not going to get much better. Montgomery Ward is simply a disappointing subject to talk about, because despite being so large and significant, they were seemingly always in trouble. Through most of their existence, Montgomery Ward has struggled to turn a profit and to keep up with their competitors. So I wanted to investigate what happened. Throughout their extensive 120 plus year history, I've identified five major mistakes that they've made that I would say have contributed to their failure. But let's start at the beginning. The name comes from Aaron Montgomery Ward, who tried to start the company in Chicago in the 1860s following the Civil War, but that proved to be bad timing. The Great Chicago Fire happened in 1871. It wiped out his inventory and he was forced to start over. 1872 is considered to be their official start. At first, they operated through their mail order catalog. They would distribute this catalog featuring all the items that they were selling and people can order them through the mail. See, at that time, no one had a car and transportation was difficult. So the idea behind this business was to target all of these isolated Midwest farmers around the area that couldn't easily make it into a city and sell them farming equipment and various household items through the mail. Montgomery Ward is considered to be the first major business to sell their items through a catalog like this. I know that you may have thought that Sears was the original, they became famous for this, but if anything, we can say that they were the copiers. Before the first Sears catalog was ever distributed in 1888, Montgomery Ward had already been doing it for 15 years. They had already bought an entire newspaper company to advertise it, they had introduced their famous money back guarantee that Sears later introduced, and they already had one 1.8 million dollars in annual sales. Sears was following their lead and used many of their established tactics to quickly become a major threat. Which leads me to their first mistake, they refused to compromise the quality of their items. Which may not sound like a mistake at first, but you have to consider the circumstances. I said that the Sears catalog started in 1888, but that one technically was put out by a predecessor company that didn't involve Alva Roebuck and only featured watches and jewelry. The first one that was put out by the famous Sears Roebuck and Company that featured a variety of items was distributed in 1893, which happens to be the same year as the Panic of 1893. It was the start of a national economic depression, which meant that the farmers didn't have much money. So Sears started selling lower quality, more affordable items. They became known for being the cheapest provider, and Richard Sears even started the slogan, We Always Undersell. On the other end, Montgomery Ward refused to compromise their quality and position themselves as a seller of higher-end, more expensive items. It was not the best strategy during a depression, and it allowed Sears the opportunity to catch up and even surpass them. The year 1900 was the first time Sears outsold Montgomery Ward, $10 million compared to $8.7 million, starting a streak that would last for the next 100 years. Montgomery Ward never reclaimed that top position, so even though all of this happened in the late 1800s, I would argue that they were still feeling the effects of it for, I guess, the next century. Now, I've been talking about catalogs throughout this whole video so far, because for a good 50 years or so, there was a huge demand for that kind of business, and it was the entirety of their business. But obviously, at one point, Montgomery Ward and Sears and many of the others transitioned into actual stores. Well, that transition for Montgomery Ward was a complete disaster. I don't think it could have gone much worse. First off, they were slow to do it, and they don't really have much of an excuse excuse here. The whole reason behind these catalogs was to sell things to people that had trouble transporting themselves to the city.
cities. Well, in the 1920s, cars became far more popular, and people could now get to these stores in the city, so they didn't need these catalogs as much. Robert E. Wood was an army general that started working for Montgomery Ward in 1919 that was actively trying to tell them this. He could tell that cars were making the catalogs less necessary, and physical retail stores would be a more promising business. Well, no one at Montgomery Ward listened to him, and the really bad part is that he left the company, went over to work for Sears, where they did listen to him. He led the successful program that caused Sears to open their first store in 1925, a full year before Montgomery Ward did it. It was a fast transition too, so time was valuable. Instead of getting a head start on these locations and potentially catching up to or even passing Sears, they were now falling even further behind. And since they did get that late start, they now felt this pressure to open so many stores as fast as they could. They were rushed, I'm guessing in poorly researched locations and disorganized because it was simply too much too fast. Within four years, they had opened over 500 stores and by the way, those were the four years leading up to the Great Depression. With all of these factors, I don't think I have to tell you that these stores were not doing too well. This is heading into their next mistake, Suelle Avery and how he played it safe after the war. You know, I realize most of these don't sound like mistakes at first, but it'll make sense in a minute. JP Morgan was a top investor in Montgomery Ward, and when they ran into these troubles during the Great Depression, he brought in Suelle Avery to run the company and hold hopefully get them out of trouble. At first, he did very well. He closed 150 of those stores, weeded out the bad management, took advantage of the economy to secure some inventory at really low prices, but here's the issue. Following World War II, the economy was actually looking pretty good, but Avery believed that there was another depression coming around the corner, which there wasn't. It might have been a once bitten, twice shy type mentality. The company ran into serious trouble expanding right before an economic depression before, so they weren't going to make that mistake twice. This meant that while most other companies, including Sears, were taking advantage of the good times and using their money to expand, Avery was saving the company's money. They weren't opening new stores, they weren't updating old ones, and they were simply just holding on to their cash, which became less and less valuable as time went on. If the economy had gone bad, they were in a position to dominate that industry, but since it didn't, the strategy only hurt them. For the next mistake, I'm going to jump ahead to the 1970s. 70s and 1980s because that's when Montgomery Ward was part of all these mergers and acquisitions. They were pretty much all disasters for both ends because remember, this company has always had trouble making money. In 1974, they were bought by Mobile, the oil company, and I'm sure you didn't expect to hear that because it really doesn't make much sense. They essentially poured half a billion dollars into it and then gave up on it when they sold it in 1988. Even their chairman at the time admitted that it's a business that we don't know too well. So as it turns out, being under the control of an oil company that didn't really know how to operate a chain of retail stores for 14 years probably didn't help their situation. So in 1988, the president of Montgomery Ward teamed up with 45 other managers and a division of General Electric to buy the company. The price they paid was $3.8 billion, and it was a leveraged buyout that added debt to the company that was already $2.3 billion in debt. It would be wrong of me not to point out that at the same time, they did sell their credit card operations to GE for $1 billion and use that money to pay off some of this debt. But it was still quite a bit. Their final mistake is really more of a result of these other mistakes, but I'm gonna make it fit into this list and say that they let the newer discount retailers surpass them. I'm talking about Walmart and Kmart and all the others that used a different, more attractive model to take away their customers. Think of it this way, Walmart was beating Sears. In 1993, they surpassed them to become the nation's largest retailer. So if Sears, the company that beat Montgomery Ward, was now getting beat themselves, what chance did Montgomery Ward have? Do you see what I'm saying here? Much like what happened to Mobile, General Electric then spent years pouring money into the company before finally giving up on it. As I said in the beginning, Montgomery Ward filed for bankruptcy in 1997, then again toward the end of 2000, and I think it should make sense now. Years of struggling to make a profit, combined with the debt that was added through these acquisitions, and now a terrible lack of sales meant that they could not afford all of these debt payments. That's the reasoning behind the bankruptcy. 
bankruptcy, and you know, this whole video has been so depressing that I want to try to end it on a more cheerful note. I'm guessing that most people have already forgotten about Montgomery Ward. Maybe you've heard of them before today, but you probably haven't been there, or if you have, they were likely already well on their way out. I mean, arguably their smoothest, most promising days were in the 1800s. And as time goes on, that memory's just going to fade more and more, but they are responsible for something that will live on for much longer. What I'm talking about is the classic Christmas character, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I know, everything seems so random with them, but believe it or not, they did create it. It's kind of a Christmas promotion, the retail stores would typically buy a bunch of coloring books and hand them out to the kids who would visit the store. Well, in 1939, they figured they would try to save some money and switch things up a bit. Instead of buying the books, they would make them themselves, and instead of a coloring book, they would make it a storybook. So they asked one of their catalog writers, Robert May, to write that story, and what he ended up writing was the original Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. They then printed 2.4 million copies of it and gave them away in stores across the country as part of their Christmas promotion. So there you go, there's a more cheerful ending, and strangely enough, I'm guessing that will be the thing that's most remembered about them. I mean, that reindeer went down in history. Let me know in the comments, what do you think of the depressing story of Montgomery Ward? If they had avoided some or all of these mistakes, would they still be around today? I would bet that if things had gone a little bit different at some of these pivotal points, they would still be significant. Also, I'm curious to know if you've ever been there, and if you have, what was your experience? If you have been only to that website, I'm not going to count that, just so you know, and any other thoughts about Montgomery Ward, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.